I, I, I don't know. Does he need an introduction? Sean Patrick Flannery is here on the show. And I want to mention before he comes on, uh, Frank and Penelope is out today in theaters. It is out today. And you need to see it. The trailer is in the description of this episode of the show. So definitely check that out. And welcome to the show, Sean Patrick Flannery. Thank you for being <laughs> here. Wow, Sean, ding. That is that is a tank top right there, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a little, it's got a little tear going on, but uh, there, how's that? Look at that? There you go. No, it yeah, looks good. Go. It's very manly. Uh, well, thank you for coming on the show. Um, you're you're in the movie, but you also directed it. I did, yeah. I wrote and directed it. And I, I'm only in the bookends. I mean, I'm in the first. I have two lines in the beginning of the movie and two lines at the end of the movie. Uh, mo most of my activity was other side of the camera. And how does that, uh, uh, oh, this is, uh, my name's Chris Gore, by the way. I don't know if you saw, and this is my colleague, Alan Ng. Hi. We're going to be asking you questions. Also, we're going to be taking questions from our chat. So if you have a question for Sean, post it in the chat right now. Uh, but, but like, what was it like, sort of like, you know, that's a challenge being in front of and behind the camera. You know, it, it, it actually wasn't. You know, if, if, if you stock the, the, the crew the correct way, uh, one of the best directors I've ever worked with in 33 years in this business, A.J. Raytano, he was my operator and my DP, and I, I, I could have left the set and he would have handled it. I, I mean, it, it's, I, I, I really had some, some, some A-team players on, on pretty much every, every department. And, you know, it, 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 it makes it easy. You know, the, somebody far asked it correctly, you pretty much turn the camera, let it happen. Well, that's the, yeah, that can be said for every department. So, you know, stepping on the other side for brief little moments was, was it was inconsequential. I mean, this is your directorial debut. What, you know, you've been, you've been in the business a long time. What, what was it about this project? I think you even co-wrote it or wrote it. Um, what was it about this project that that really that you wanted to get your put yourself behind it so to speak well alan gilmer the ep uh himself and scott dolezal they contacted me about uh directing and i've had opportunities to direct in the past but but never with the sort of unbridled creative freedom in in the artistry in, in the writing and everything that, that that they were offering with this and that, man, that, that, that is incredibly rare. Um, you know, I, I, I asked if I could write it from page one. They said, absolutely. Um, and we went on a location scout. And I mean, everything I, everything I saw, I kind of incorporated it into the script. Like I saw, I saw the cistern. I saw the 68 Super B. Um, and, and we came up with something. And we were always looking in the same direction. It, it was just an amazing experience. And, you know, all directing opportunities aren't like that. I, I know those opportunities are unicorns, but, uh, you know, now that I've seen one up close, I want to heard of those things, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're getting a lot of love in the chat. Do you mind if we uh, go to some chat questions from uh, the, the people watching today? Man, I would love to go where there's some love. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of love right now. So post your post more of your questions here. But uh, Goober says, Boondock Saints. You're gonna you're gonna get that. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not the I don't Batman. hate on it. I, I, I don't hate on it at all. No, it's great. Not the Batman says Sean Buff Patrick Flannery. There you go. Blah blah says awesome film. So some people have have already seen it. Macho man Sean Flannery says <laughs> Solomon Thornton. And uh, uh, here and here we go. Dempsey asks, did your martial arts training help you with the discipline needed for film directing? You know, I you know, w w without sand sounding like a, a a cliche, my martial art helps me in every aspect of life. I mean that that red mat that when I'm when I'm not joking that red mat is you know, fifty yards on my property outside back window. It is my sanctuary. It is my therapy. It is my cathedral. It is all of the above. It helps me in every aspect of my life. I would not be the same person without it. Uh, another question for you here from Solomon Thornton. Love you in Boondock Saints. What is your process for filmmaking? Man, you know what? I don't even know what a process is. I'll, I'll give you an example. Like in writing, uh, 
Well, t- t- take acting, for example. Everybody has everybody talks about the process, and I think every actor wants to make it sound like they had to endure some t- tormental ordeal to really get the creative juices out of them. Man, I had a wonderful upbringing. I was close with my mom, my dad, my mama, my granddaddy. You know, I, I, I God, God bless people that have, ha- haven't had the uh, as wonderful an upbringing, but I didn't have a lot of trauma in my life. Um, you know, and my research for any role starts at page one and ends at fade out. Um, if, if I were to play a homeless person, I don't need to go defecate on myself and sleep on the street for a week to get into character. But that's that, that's just me. Um, my process for writing, for example, you know, like you, you, you read some writing books and, you know, you have to make bullet points and then an outline and they're putting sticky notes everywhere. And there's a process you have to go there. There's one incarnation, then a second, then a third. You know, I, I write by saying the, the wouldn't it be cool if rule. I start by, hmm, wouldn't it be cool if the movie started this way? And I write it. I, I, I know that's a fifth grade kind of way, but I just start and I finish. I don't do an outline. I don't do bullet points. Um, um, that doesn't say that doesn't mean to suggest that I don't do my homework. 100% I do my homework. Dude, there's nothing left to chance whenever I arrive on the set. Um, I have the shot list complete. I have a secondary shot list. Should we not be able to realize A? I have a wish, wish list of an A, B, and a C. So if I can't get my A shot list, I at least need B. And at the worst case scenario, I need everything on C. I know the angles I, I, I want to shoot, everything. Everybody has their own way of doing it. But I, I fear my way may be looked at as uh, more, I, I, I don't know, less, uh, less, less uh, high end, high brow. I just kind of do it. My writing style is I just start writing and, and I don't do the end first and then make it meet somewhere. I don't pay attention to by page 17, you know how you need to have introduced your antagonist. I don't follow any of those rules. Now, having said that, people may see it and go, well, that's why your film sucks. I don't know. But <laughs> I just know the way that I do it. And it's the only way I can do it. You know, it's 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 the only way that comes natural to me. My, my granddaddy was, you know, probably one, one, one of my favorite storytellers I've ever met. And uh, I, I loved the way that he painted pictures with his words. And uh, man, if I, if I got 10% of that, then you know, I, 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 I'd be flattered. Let me, let me ask you oh, let me real, real quick, a couple, couple quick comments here and a good question here. Uh, Daniel says, I'm getting jazzed to see this. And then a big question I know everybody's got top of mind. Uh, Shadow Fenir, Fenrir 24 says, Boondock Saints 3, when? I don't know, man. Stay tuned, brother. Stay tuned. <laughs> okay. All right. Sorry, Alan. Sorry I interrupted you. Yeah. There. No, I want to uh, ask you about the story. Uh, I, I kind of saw it as kind of a, uh, a modern noir, but but what really struck out to me was uh, someone mentioned in the chat earlier today, but men were men and women were women. Um, you know, I you you, you know, I, I like the portrayal that you have of your characters because they feel like more everyday people who are who are just trying to struggle and, and make it through life. What what was it about your story that that appealed to you and that kind of bloomed into what Frank and Penelope is? <clears throat> well, you know, I, I mean, it, it, it is. It, they are everyday people. They're, they're the type of people that I associate with on a daily basis. They're the type of people that I know. Um, you know, I, I, I live in Texas. I, I don't I don't live out in Hollywood. It's it's. You know, it's the way people meet men are visually driven creatures. So I wanted his first attraction to Penelope be primal lust. I didn't want it painted with, you know, eloquent words or anything. I wanted it to be primal lust. And I wanted to see her attraction to him. You know, I'm a firm believer that, you know, men learn to fall in love with the women they find attractive. And I'm a firm believer that gen- these are generalities, but I think that generally speaking, women learn to find attractive the men they fall in love with. So I wanted it to un- un- unfold in that manner. You know, through the course of dialogue, she finally realizes like that is that guy. It's that guy that I was told about in the storybooks and all of these rules that I that, that I were told. It's that guy right there. And he's sitting right in front of me. But it doesn't hit her. You know, I, I mean, he's just another person whenever he comes into her life. But uh, being a visually driven creature, you know, the, the image of her is very different on his psyche. Cool. Uh, Flaccid Phoenix asks, what scene in Frank and Penelope was the most difficult or fun to shoot? Man, uh, everything in that cistern was difficult. We went on, you know, I, we went on a location scout 
and I started writing it. I wrote the first 38 pages on the first three day location scout and everything that I saw, I saw the 68 Dodge Coronet to Super B, man. It's, it's a, I, 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 if, if, if you meet a director that can write a script and he sees that at the location, doesn't put in the movie, man, kick him. That's, I, it, it, it was an obvious thing for me. And I saw the cistern. Now this thing has, you know, 15 foot walls. It's a giant concrete obelisk. It's, it's just, it, 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 it's, 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 it's horrific, it's dangerous, it's foreboding. And getting in and out of that thing to shoot was physically a nightmare. And it's in Trilingual, Texas, so it's a buck 15 out. You know, everybody's being threatened with, you know, you know heat stroke and it, it, was a, it was a task, man. And everything was on a Jenny too. There's nothing you could plug into for an outlet. So we had roll on generators. It was a, it was a difficult, for, for, for logistic reasons, it, it was incredibly difficult, but, uh, there wasn't anything, you know, hard acting wise, um, you know, because I think I think in my opinion, I think I cast it correctly. You know, everybody did their job. We showed up. We had a handful of days of rehearsal beforehand. So everybody was off book. It was uh, um, it was really it was a breeze. And, I, you know, I've been doing this 33 years. So there, there are no independent films that go without hiccups. So, you know, yeah. obviously the car broke down. We had to rewrite on the on the fly. And you you have to pivot and adapt instantaneously to get a film made. Um, so did I realize every one of my ideas, secrets and dreams? Absolutely not, but I'm happy with where we ended up. You know, there, there, there's one of the scenes where, you know, the Cadillac drives down a dirt hill. A, Jonathan Sheck wasn't ready yet, so I jumped, behind, I was driving it and the car didn't start. So I was coasting it down the dirt road and we had to add in the motor sound afterwards. So things like that. I mean, that's one example of like, holy shit, what that was supposed to be at dusk. We shot it at drove it. And since the car's not on, it's power steering's out. So I had to wrench it just to not go off that dirt road. It was uh, <laughs> things like, that. you know, AJ is like lifting the camera up. He's going, go now, go now, go now. It was, you know, it was just, uh, but, but we got it. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, we got it. Here, here's some more questions or comments for you. Blah, blah says art should have an element of danger to it. And then not the Batman says, come on chat. Sean is here. Young Indiana Jones. It's Canon. He's Indiana Jones. <laughs> you must get that a lot. Well, I appreciate man. I'm flattered, man. It's uh, you know, you know, for me, Harrison Ford's Indiana Jones, you know, uh, I'm young Indiana Jones, but uh, I mean, Harrison Ford's like our last real, iconic movie star not not just famous actor but montgomery clift harrison ford you know what i mean it's uh man those are shoes i don't i don't want to even try to fill you know what and was that, it like playing an iconic character before the internet was a thing <laughs> man it, it well 36 people saw young indiana jones and i counted my mom 19 <laughs> So, um, you know, it was, uh, you know, it's kind of crazy. I was out of the country the entire time filming that. So I never really, I never even got to see it on TV. And, uh, and then it turns out people, a lot of people didn't even see it. So, I mean, I'm proud of that. I mean, I wouldn't be, every door that's open to me today was opened ultimately because of young Indiana Jones. I certainly wouldn't have done anything prior to this that, that allowed me the opportunity or afforded me the opportunity to direct a movie without young Indiana Jones. So. Uh, dear George Lucas, thank you, sir. Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, another question, Jackie Ripper. What are you most proud of in your career so far? Um, I'm going to be real honest with you. Uh, outside of fatherhood, because nothing else is even close to fatherhood, and, and, and I don't say that as a hallmark card. Absolutely nothing is close to my family. Um, so we'll talk about everything outside of that and it's right over here. I'm just going to reach and grab it for accomplishments that I get zero money for that. But <laughs> if I had to hand something in, um, you know, I always make an analogy to my jujitsu students. If somebody came to me and said, Hey, uh, I'll give you, and I'm, I'm making up a lewd dollar figure and I'm talking about it being real. $500 million in liquid cash. If you give up these 10 films and with those 10 films, every door that was opened by those films, every relationship, every dollar, I could find 10 films and, and, and I, I could, I would trade 
10, 10 specific films for that suitcase. I, I would not trade that. And that's not an understatement. You, not, not even with a gun to my head. What it's done for my life and what it allows me to leave behind to my kids, it's, uh, it's uh, one of the things I look back on and I, 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 I would be a different human being if they were removed from me. And by that, I mean every relationship that I formed under this, every bit of confidence, uh, everything that it did to my life. I would never give that up. I would never in a million years. I would be in strict poverty before I would give that up. Wow. Because with that, it allowed me to pull myself out of poverty. It allowed me to do a lot of things. And I don't say that lightly. Um, but number one, my family. Not even close. Second place is not even close. Um, another question here. Daniel says, what's the inspiration to tell this particular story? You know, A, I love telling stories. And, uh, you know, it came to me, you know, if anybody knows, like, my writing, my, my, my book, um, or Born a Champion, you know, I tend, I, I, I have a certain uh, voice and a certain vernacular that I use. You know, I, I don't tend to write horror genre um, uh, but I do love telling stories. So I did my best to convert something that we wanted to shoot and make it a little road trip horror movie, but I turned it into what I would say is an allegorical love story. Um, and my inspiration, it's easy for that because that's what I write. I, I, I write love stories. That's what I write. Um, without sounding too, you know, soft, that's what I write. At the core of this movie, it's a love story. And if it doesn't work between Frank and Penelope, none of the violence works. Um, so that's where my inspiration comes. My inspiration comes from love. It comes from love in everything I do in my life. Right. Um, Solomon Thornton says, a family man, I salute you. That's great. And then Dempsey has a question here. How much weight does score carry in your film? Immense. I'll give an example. When you get a budget, you know, nine times out of 10, and again, I've been doing this 33 years, so I've seen the way the sausage is made from every single angle. Um, I'm arguably one of the most overqualified first-time directors because I, I truly am a student of the art. I've asked questions. I've asked questions from Dave Tattersall, who won Academy Awards on Young Indiana Jones. I always want to know, what is that light? How come that's brighter? Oh, it's key light. What, what does a key light mean? Uh, everything, I ask questions. So I did my homework. I, I, I didn't want to show up and be directing a set and not know at least a good portion of every single person's job. Um, in the same respect, when I waited tables, you know, and I thought, man, if it doesn't work out, I'm going to manage one of these restaurants. I wanted to know how to expedite. I wanted to run, know how to run the dishwasher. I wanted to know how to short cook, long cook. I wanted all of that stuff. Um, so ha having said that, a, 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 a big part a big part of the budget is usually you, you spend the budget and then you go and you beg and you plead for music. For me, I wrote this on the, the location scout and I wrote it to music and I had a very specific song list as the, I always listen to music in everything in my life. Everything wonderful in my life has always had, has a soundscape. And if you play a song, I can tell you the first time I heard it, you know, if I could smell the chlorophyll and the freshly cut grass in my first football game when I was six years old, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I know what it does to me. Um, so I wanted, I went with the budget and I talked to, you know, Alan Gilmer, I said, Scott Dole all the producers said, can we allocate this percentage of the budget already to get these songs? And then we can economize a little bit with the remainder to make sure that we get the film shot, but it's important to me. And they agreed. And so we got all of my music for this and then hiring the, the composers for the original bits of score. I'll tell you a funny story. Um, Donna Dierico, who is in my movie, she called me and she said, Hey, you know, uh, I, 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 do you have a composer yet? I said, no, not yet. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm looking, but you know, I was, I was probably going to use my composer that I hired for Born a Champion. And uh, she said, well, you know, my son, he's a composer. And in all honesty, full disclosure, I didn't say it to her, but on the other end of the phone, I'm going, oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> oh, no. How am I going to navigate this shit? Of course, my uh, son's a composer. You know, here comes the nepotism. <laughs> yeah. I, I gave her a promise and I'm a man of my word. I looked at his website. I looked at his demos. And I thought, this, this dude is more than credible. I contacted him and I said, you know, a lot, a lot of name composers won't do this. I said, would you give me a, get, th throw something at me. Here's a temp. Give me your best 
change of this. This is the feeling that I want. And I wanted something very specific. I wanted a song, a, a, a composition called Gassenhauer. It was ori originally used in Badlands, uh, uh, a, a film from the 70s by another amazing director and a Texan. Um, and he and his partner came back with something that blew my mind. And I ended up hiring him and his partner. And I think they cracked this over the center field fence and it's in the parking lot somewhere, man. It started off as, of course, your son's a composer um, to holy shit, what a gift. Um, it's Donna Dierico's son and his partner, but they're, they're, they're credible composers. It's, it's not like this was their first composition. They're long in the tooth. They've been doing this forever and they're incredible musicians and brother, I hit the lottery with that. That was another one of the most wonderful phone calls that's ever befallen me. It fell in my lap and I, inside, I was, oh my God, how am I going to navigate? How am I going to tell her I chose somebody else? But that's the true story. Uh, music is incredibly powerful for me. I'll give an example. I could shoot a purse falling off a building in slow motion and it's a purse falling off a building in slow motion. I put it to Gimme Shelter by the Stones it's a piece of fucking art. There's more power and emotion. I've learned more philosophy from music than actual philosophy. Um, music is a driving source behind my inspiration, my creative, everything. So that was that was a leading seat coming out of the gate for me. Cool. Uh, another couple of questions here. We, we got a lot of questions. I don't think we're going to get to them all. Uh, but Jack T. Ripper asks, if you were to shoot the film again, is there anything you would do differently? Uh, if anybody ever tells you no, they're full of shit. Of course, man. <laughs> of course, man. I mean, how arrogant if I said, no, exactly what I intend. No, you live and you learn. Back and you're like, I wish I'd have thought of that prior. Wish I'd have thought of this prior. Having said that, I'm incredibly happy where this film ended up. I mean, we didn't have a ton of money to go do it. Um, everybody, you know, it's not that they under promised, but they certainly over delivered. Um, and I asked the crew on day one, I said, guys, I'm going to ask y'all to hold my hand. You you are better than me in your respected field. And I am going to use this opportunity to learn from y'all. I'm going to take uh, advice from y'all. And they did. They held my hand the entire way. And it was a wonderful experience. But yes, of course, there's things that you look at on the day and you're like, I wish I would have foreseen this. I wish I, I, I would have more, more eloquently navigated that. Um, but I'm happy with where it ended up. I really am. Right. And uh, Daniel for $5 Super Chat says, I'm convinced. Hand the keys to Disney over to this man. <laughs> we were talking about we we're talking about Disney and some people uh, having issues with Star Wars. And, and I, I, I'm among them. And, and that's a whole discussion that I think a lot of fandom talks about. Um, but, you know, when you meet some a lot of people in the indie film world, this is why we really like to promote independent films on our on our channel and on filmthreat.com. And by the way, there's a really great review of your movie on filmthreat.com right now. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah, I don't know if you see it. But um, yeah, but uh, yeah, this is why we say, like, look, if you're disappointed with this other stuff, there's so much more out there to check out, including your film, which is in theaters today. I want to say Zach's comment is Sean Patrick Flannery versus Johnny Lawrence in a cage. Let's make this happen. <laughs> who, who, who is Johnny Lawrence? Johnny Lawrence is from Cobra Kai. Um, he's oh. uh, he was the nemesis <laughs> in The Karate Kid. Are you talking about Billy Zapka? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know Billy? Yeah. Okay, check it out. Man, first of all, um, I did a movie called A Tiger's Tale, um, where Billy Zapka beats up C. Thomas Howell. I'm an, I, I have two lines in that movie. It was when I was going to University of St. Thomas, and they filmed it here in Houston. Um, so I met him on that. Then when I moved out to California, I was waiting tables at TGI Fridays, and I used to wait on Billy Zapka. Now, yeah. let me tell you something about Billy Zapka. That dude is the coolest dude I've ever met. I mean, he might as well have been Elvis Presley back when I was waiting tables. And dude remembered me from the – dude Dude just treated me like like a buddy. I, and, and it was a really – you know, it's not lost on me. Back then, that, that was like a welcome mat into the industry. I thought, this dude's been in everything. And he's just a regular like, hey, man, what's up? Good to see – I was just like, holy shit, man. 
That is a solid dude top to bottom. So how about me and Joey Lawrence versus any other two dudes? Because I got Joey's back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the uh, the character is so great in Cobra Kai. I think you would, yeah. you would love that show. And uh, unfortunately, we got to wrap it up. But one last question for you. What is your dream project to work on in the future? Man, it's good. Something good. There is no genre that I dig. Um, but realistically, um, what I'm – reason I'm on my computer right now, this, I'm turning this into a screenplay adaption and that's pretty high on my priority list. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of companies have come out of the woodwork to get the rights to it, but, but it's a little bit too personal story to me to just kind of hand over for money. So, uh, I kind of want to hands on. So I'm in the process of doing that. So my, my, my dream project would be seeing Jane two to fruition. That's great. Uh, Sean Patrick Flannery, thank you so much for joining us on the Film Threat Podcast. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Congratulations on the movie. Frank and Penelope is in theaters. Make sure you go check it out. I'm sure, it's coming, I'm sure it's coming to video on demand at some point, but see it however you can. Sean, thanks for spending time with us today. This is awesome. Thank you guys very much, man. God bless and Godspeed. Thank you. All right. Take care.